and welcome back to the hot lap. We are doing the Australian Grand Prix preview. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. But not only that, we've got a few other things to talk about other than the Australian Grand Prix preview, the home race for Daniel Ricciardo and Oscar Piastri. And let's be fair, one of them is under a lot more pressure, I think, than the other. And that's despite it being their home race. We'll certainly get into that. A couple of stories are F1 fans deliver damning verdicts. Yes, there is an interesting story on the race on a poll they did, and it kind of is similar to the viewing figures video we had the other day, which I would like to get into. And last but not least, Hash, though, Hash, Hass even, are still very unsure of their tyres still, which is a bit of a concern because we all thought they'd pretty much figured it all out. But here we go, our Australian Grand Prix preview. First of all, before we do anything, let's take a look at the Australian Grand Prix track at Albert Park. And let's be fair, what a lovely track it is. As you can see, we're starting, and it's really, really important here, to get a solid exit on that last corner, especially in qualifying. But even in the race, I mean, that was fairly conservative. The reason why is because this is your... We've now entered the, the DRS zone. we passed the detection zone, enter that DRS zone into the first lap. And this is one of the key overtaking places, albeit that first chicane is... Let's be fair, that first chicane is quite... Is fairly, fairly fast in terms of turn one and two, which is essentially a really, really fast chicane. And so... I mean, when I do, I break a bit. It's nice to break early, then put the put the power on. And this is the second, D. I believe this is the, this is the second DRS zone, and this is another overtaking place that's quite popular here. Um, we've had a few crashes here, particularly Fernando Alonso in 2000, and um, I forgot now, but it was definitely it was definitely in the Honda, if you remember. So moving forward, moving forward from there, um, is. This bit here, and this is where the we're getting to know where the, where the track has fundamentally changed it. This corner now is so important. This corner is absolutely key uh, to get that. It's a lot more open than it has been than, than it has been in the past. This is one of the key corners they changed, and now it's a straight run. And this is where Max Verstappen, the last couple of years with that Red Bull, has been absolutely, absolutely dominant. Another DRS zone. As you can see, and then we're at the fastest chicane. We one of the fastest chicanes we have in Formula One. The left and the right, which is again really, really important. The left and the right essentially turns nine and ten here at Melbourne. As you can see, I've got it. I got it completely wrong, but it's really important to put that power on because down here is another. Is essentially another overtaking. You can you can overtake here. We've seen them overtake it, and they've made this corner here a lot sharper coming in essentially 9 10 this is corner this is corner number 11 as we go as we enter the last part of the track essentially and this is where you've got to be really close if you can i mean it's difficult to pass in the last corner it's been done before in that into that last corner and you want to stay as close as you can obviously to the car in front to get that good run again either in qualifying or in the race to do it to, to, to basically to do it all again so let's talk about the let's talk about some of the track facts then going into the, the australian grand prix in in melbourne so it joined the calendar as you may be aware in um 1996 it replaced adelaide as the host of the australian grand prix and interestingly adelaide was always one of the last races this being one of the first, notably, and uh, until Bahrain changed that. However, next year it is the first race, and they say a great place, an absolutely great place for a race. It is. So moving on from that, um, its track length in kilometres is 5.278. Uh, the race length is 306, just over 306 kilometres at 58 laps. It has 14 turns. It says here the circuit was open in 1953, but as we know. In Formula 1, we saw that first race in 1996 with Damon Hill 1. So far, 26 races held. There was a pause during the pandemic. A track record, Max Verstappen, 116.732. And a track record, um, but a lap record of 120.235. And that's Sergio Perez, both in 2023. And since it first, and since it hosted the 1996 uh, race, 
As I mentioned, there's been 26 Formula One races and there's been 15 different Grand Prix winners. Now, the most successful driver, Michael Schumacher. He's won more races than anyone else in 2000. So quite late, really, when you think uh, it came in 2000, 2001, 2002 and 2004. Four. Now, Ferrari are the team with the most Albert Park wins. They have nine in total, including uh, victories in three of the last five races there. Now, while Ferrari are the team with the most wins, Mercedes-powered cars have the most wins on the circuit, having won 11 times. British and German drivers are currently tied for the most wins with nine apiece. Finland are the only other nation with multiple wins here. Valtteri Bottas took their total up to four in 2019. We had, was that version two or three of Bottas? Only three drivers, though, have taken consecutive wins. Schumacher holds the record for most consecutive wins at Albert Park, having won three years in a row, 2000, 2001, and 2002. Vettel and Button are the only three drivers to have taken back-to-back -back wins at the track, which is interesting. Four teams have success at Albert Park. Obviously, McLaren, with... Uh, Hamilton, Button, Coulthard, Renault, Ferrari, Mercedes are the four teams to have taken consecutive wins, that is, at Albert Park. Positively Red Bull this year, Ferrari hold the record for the most successive wins at the circuit, having won four times in a row. So that's pretty much some of the stats that you may or may not be interested in at Albert Park. But let's get into our podium prediction at Albert Park. So who is going to finish? Who do we believe is going to finish third? in Albert Park. It's not Verstappen. No. It's not Perez. It's not a Mercedes driver or McLaren. I think it's realistically as much as I want as much as I want it to be Oscar Piastri. That would be fantastic. I think it's probably all things being equal it's probably going to be Charles Leclerc. Why? Uh he's he finished third at the last two races. That Ferrari is the that Ferrari is I think now quite clearly the second best car that we have in Formula One at the moment and I think it's just going to continue where this is not quite like Saudi you know it is quite close to the water I think this Ferrari will be close to the Red Bull but probably particularly in race place race place not close enough to trouble the Red Bull which is why this guy here this man here Sergio Perez I think is going to be finishing third sorry second second no second not third um Qualifying, I mean, like this time last year, it was an absolute joke, wasn't it? He looked like a rookie. Um, not the Ollie Bourbon type of rookie, though. Just a very bad rookie. And uh, he's started the season off really, really well so far. And I think Sergio Perez will finish second. The only issue could be, yes, you can pass this. Easier to pass than Saudi, I think. The only issue could be qualifying, because it's not really his forte, is it? And... Um, but second, really, once again, it's the race. It's all about the race pace for that Red Bull. Last but not least, yes, this man here, Max Verstappen. I mean, it's a fairly safe podium, really, isn't it? No excitement here. Max Verstappen first. Um, could he get pole? Yes, he's probably favourite for pole. However, I do feel like we saw at Le with Leclerc in Bahrain, where there is every potential for Max to lose pole with a really, really solid lap from Leclerc. That wouldn't surprise me. But, once again, come race day, all things being equal, bearing an incident, an incident at the first corner or any unreliability, let's be fair, it is going to be Max Verstappen taking that win in Australia without too much too much of a doubt. So, I mean, yeah, sad a bit, maybe. But what I also wanted to get to is some talking points going into the Australian Grand Prix. One of the big talking points is not even about one of the big teams. It's about one of the home drivers. And as you may have predicted, it sadly, it is not Oscar Piastri. It's this guy, Daniel Ricciardo. This man is under pressure as we go into the Australian Grand Prix, which is sad because it is his home Grand Prix. And he himself has said, I'm under, you know, I feel under pressure for my home Grand Prix. And um, former F1 mechanic, you may know him on YouTube, Mark Priestley, he reckons Daniel Ricciardo's career is running down the clock, which is a bit, you know, sad. And that's something also that Alan Jones has come out and said. So as we know, the, Aust the Australian, he secured that full-time return in 2024 after an, an average but fantastic Mexico. But other than that, quite an average 
2023 albeit he did have his broken hand but uh, but he showed familiar performance levels when he was dropped by the mclaren squad so far in 2022 at least that's from mr priestley now having been dropped by mclaren ahead of the final year of his three-year deal he spent most of 2023 watching from the sidelines until he took over essentially nick de Vries. however he's only had a handful of races so far and between then and the end of the season he picked up a hand injury as we know in zandvoort and as a result it's taken until this year for him to get a proper run of things but and we're only people are only basing it on the two races which i think might be a bit unfair but from those first two races they've suggested not a whole lot has changed for ricardo and he's struggled to keep pace with yuki sonoda there's been differing strategies brought um brought ricardo into sonoda's range in bahrain but without team orders he probably well, potentially would have finished behind the japanese driver we don't know for sure now in saudi arabia he toiled around the back a very slow spit spit a very slow pit stop did not help matters to be fair to ricardo but then he kind of looked a bit amateurish by spinning at turn one all by himself in the final stages of that race now as a result the pressure is already they said starting to mount on the popular australian as he heads to his home race in melbourne a former mclaren mechanic turned media personality mark Priestley believes Ricardo's time is running out and that the 2024 could be the last chance saloon for him. I, to be fair, I always think a lot of people believe 2024 will be a last chance saloon in respect of Sonoda or Ricardo. It feels it feels like only one of them is going to survive a Highlander um, moment. If there ever was one, there can only be one. So Danny Ricardo at the other end of, the, of his career, he's going to be getting this massive hurry up from Helmet Marco, who's also come out in the media and said, he needs a hurry up. Priestley said on his own YouTube channel ahead of the Australian Grand Prix, which I thought was interesting, he's getting the world starting to talk about him in terms of questioning him. If he really is, he really what everyone thought he was? Is it the excitement we thought it was going to be when he came back to the sport? Actually, he's not beating his teammate consistently enough, and that is the very first step to becoming a legendary driver in Formula One. You have to beat your teammate. He's not doing that. Uh, enough and i think with young drivers poking their heads around and saying look at me hashtag ollie berman liam lawson danny ricardo has got time running out on his formula one career and he concluded by saying it's a shame i think he's a great guy a great character in the sport and has been a really great driver but he seems to have made some poor decisions that have cost him dearly over the course of the last few years and i wonder if we might be seeing the last of him in 2024 let's hope not so danny ricardo please we want you to do better. I want you to do better. Get points for the Australian Grand Prix so we don't have to talk about this again because he's one of the... Uh, I think he's one of the most popular drivers on the grid. We need you to stay, but you can only stay if you're good enough. Um, and we know how savage... We know how savage the Red Bull team can be. So next up is, is not necessarily a driver I want to talk about. It's a whole team that I would very much like to talk about. And yes, here we go, Mercedes. What is going on at the end of at the end of testing? I mean, I think even James Allison uh, attributed to the fact that he felt giddy going into this season. They were so excited. Bahrain was a bit lackluster. Yes, we kind of had the excuse. Okay, we'll give you your overheating engine modes, etc., and you know you're setting up your car for the race. Then came Saudi Arabia, and oh dear. Um, qualifying wasn't great for Hamilton. Russell's been the star of qualifying. Hamilton has been faster in the race if you look at, if you look at the uh, the overall lap times. However, they are very much looking like the fourth fastest team, just I feel, behind McLaren. And if Aston Martin get a really good setup during the race, it wouldn't be surprising if they could be the fifth fastest team. I think so far, other than Red Bull being so dominant, Mercedes have been the biggest disappointment in 2024. And people ask, what, what, I mean, even like things like planetf1.com, which I'm looking at the story, they said, what performance is missing from the Mercedes? And they put four key areas to address. Um, we've got um, high speed cornering. Now, if Saudi was anything to go by, yes, the McLaren in Saudi Arabia, Lando's McLaren, did have a lot more downforce on, we've, we've, I think, since learned. So it looked worse than it was, but it was just gone. I mean, sometimes he was so much faster in that first sector, Lewis couldn't even get in the DRS zone, even though I can't ever feel that Lewis was kind of on par with that McLaren. Uh, but that's the main area on, of concern, uh, is 
I mean, even the seven-time world champion said uh, it felt like they were in a different category. He said, I mean, the car is good in low speed and not so bad in the medium, but in the high speed, we are miles off. He said to Sky Sports at the time. He said, the guys were, it was like I was in a different category when I was going through the high speed between the other people and the other guys around me. Um, so it's frustrating for sure to be three years in a row in almost the same position, or it's definitely tough, but we'll get our heads down and we'll keep working away. And I know everyone back at the factory is pushing as hard as they can, but we've definitely got to make some big changes. I think they all do. Stability is another one. Linked to the car issues in these high-speed corners has been the lack of, yes, that um, horrible rear-end stability is back for the drivers, with both Hamilton and George Russell um, enduring and when you see it it does look fairly uncomfortable these snaps of oversteer making it quite difficult to trust that car um, i mean toto wolf has explained that yes we've got a quick car but it's on a knife edge the drivers are struggling to squeeze out the lap time consistently and anyone will tell you if you are not confident in a place like saudi arabia a street circuit with walls either side then things like monaco it's going to be exactly the same yeah monaco is obviously slightly lower speed but you're going to need confidence in that car but interestingly toto did say george was on his way to a strong lap and could have been fighting for spots on the second row unfortunately yep he lost the rear of the car downforce being another one which is linked obviously to the stability etc so putting a bigger rear or rear wing on uh to add downforce now wolf was candid in admitting the w15 is naturally lacking on the front compared to their fastest rivals making obviously those high speed corners questionable he said i think there's a big factor with that lacking high speed than just a rear wing we've been missing downforce beyond the steps that you will have a bigger rear wing that's not always going to be the answer he said we tried it on lewis they have something which we don't um and they have something which we don't understand because we are quick everywhere else pretty much we know that we have a smaller rear wing we are compensating that we're losing that through the corners but it's just the high speed variant where we're losing all that lap time porpoising yes it just won't go away from mercedes will it mercedes fans heart sank with flashbacks to 2022 but don't panic too much here. And Planet, the article from Planet F1 says, while porpoising has largely been eradicated, Mercedes have mentioned that bouncing has made something of a return. Though not to the same degree, it will be something the team will uh, look to settle, hopefully, sooner rather than later. And Andrew Shovelin said, in qualifying, they're suffering a bit with the bouncing, and that's less, thank goodness, of a problem during the race. Uh, I mean, it's just Mercedes, massive, massive questions there for, for Mercedes without, you know, with their speed. They're not the fastest also in, in you know, in their high speed scenarios as well, which maybe you thought they, they would be. Yes, they're faster than McLaren, but I think a lot of people were. So, yeah, not good. Um, oh, dear. So, last but by no means least, and a bit, bit of a shorter talking point, though, is going gonna, is gonna to be who is going to be in that second Ferrari seat. Yes, probably Carlos Sainz. Albeit, I think he's in Australia now as we speak. He went there early. But, and here's the big but, as we know, Nick De Vries, um, I think Albon needed about a good couple of weeks, didn't he? For that for that appendicitis. Uh, and Carlos Sainz, potentially, we won't know until maybe the second practice session as to how he is getting on at Ferrari. So, it's going to be really interesting to see. I mean, potentially two things. One, how fast is Carlos Sainz going to be in that Ferrari in Melbourne? Or two, how fast is Oli Berman going to be on a track which is a bit easier to learn than Saudi? And maybe he'll have more time. Maybe they make the decision after practice one. I kind of expect Carlos Sainz to do it because he's not. He's going to. He want. He's going to want to show everyone I'm back. I'm fast because, as we know, this guy's currently unemployed for 2025 however there was lots to talk about him potentially going to mercedes also alonso potentially going to mercedes verstappen potentially going to mercedes so all of that i think is really exciting stuff going into the australian grand prix and hopefully at least uh, all three of those questions hopefully are going to be answered i imagine that ferrari one might also be answered before friday but definitely after friday which would be quite nice so let's I mean let's get into let's get into the other stuff let's get into the other stuff here. So this is from this is from the race and I thought this sadly I did think this was slightly concerning and it's linked 
This is linked into our video the other day. F1 fans deliver damning verdicts. Yeah, this so as I said, from the race, they've said that fans delivering worrying verdict on F1 2024 so far. And this is just after two races. Um, and they said Formula One fans have delivered a worrying verdict on the 2024 season so far. And that's in a poll that received, what, 150,000 responses. So around 61% of the respondents on their YouTube poll said they were less excited for the rest of the 2024 F1 season versus their pre-season expectations. We all, as always, classic with with trailers, game trailers, film trailers, we all get, excuse me, we all get far too excited about stuff. And we, we all hype ourselves up, don't we? You know, McLaren are going to be awesome, Mercedes is going to be back. And then, like a brick wall, Bahrain hits us with a bit of reality. So, that compared, so they've said, 61%, and that's over half, less than excited. That compared to 32%, though, that said it was the same as before. And a slender, small, 7% of uh, participants said they were more excited now. Verstappen fans, clearly. Maybe Paris fans. Definitely Red Bull fans. So what the fans said, so over 1,100 comments were left on the poll, and these were some of the popular responses. And as you can hear, the one user said, I had low expectations, but damn, I was disappointed. Another said, like an unskippable ad. No, nothing changed in the official driver lineup. No new tracks. More Red Bull domination. F2 and F3 is better off being the premier event of the weekend rather than F1. In terms of excitement, yeah, you're right. Um, Kitty Hawk 2000, the internal drama with Red Bull is far more exciting than anything on track. Um, Mo Loco, 99RH, he said, like the 2023 season never ended based on the, how the opening two races have gone. Some of the criticism the race have said has been centred around the lack of a title fight and, let's be fair, a very predictable winner week in, week out, being kind of boring. Um, one, one, one user said, Amato52322, I love F1. I've only missed one race since 1996. Wow. But Max Verstappen domination is really testing my love for the sport. I know it goes in cycles. I've done the Michael Schumacher, Vessel, Hamilton domination, but this time it feels more ominous. Maybe I'm just getting old. I don't think you are. 5232. I think it's because Perez is not good enough to have a challenge for Max. At least, particularly with the Nico Rosberg Hamilton stuff, we went in to the weekend not knowing which one of those two are going to be fastest. But now it's just kind of getting a bit sad, isn't it? Isn't it? Al Bordua, uh, you know, well, 2046, um, he said, I'm less excited, but not because Max is winning. I like Max. It's because he lacks a proper rival with whom he'll have a proper battle for the lead with to make the show more interesting. Hello, 2021. Completely agree. But for others, they said, it's not even that one driver and team is dominating. One, one guy said, my issue isn't that there is one dominant driver. It's there are no overtly fun battles. Crazy overtake or drama. Yeah, we didn't. It was a bit meh, really, Bahrain. Even in 2023, when you look behind that Red Bull domination, there were exciting stories. And that doesn't seem to be happening now. And someone's put, probably not renewing F1 TV in April. Ouch. But awaiting another race, just to be sure. So far, it's a yawn fest. And backing them up was another guy, Invisible Kid 99 saying they've cancelled their Sky Sports UK. That's the UK broadcast for F1. So that says enough. And that's quite expensive. I mean, getting Sky Sports set up, uh, I mean, you're looking at just the basic package, uh, unless you get like a really killer deal. You're looking at £50 or more. And that, um, I think, I mean, I, they were advertising the F1 channel just a 10, 11 pounds, I think, extra recently at the beginning of the season. But yeah, um, so that's it. It's not looking good, is it? And what's going to be really interesting, if this domination continues, are the viewers, uh, is the viewers going to go down? I imagine it probably will. Um, and they want to, you know, um, you know, the American audience, they've already gone down. We've already done a piece, a story about the viewers going down. So... It's going to be quite interesting. So moving on from that, we are our last story, our last story of the day. Let me just uh, get the clicking right. It's going to be Haas. Yeah. So I thought this was interesting. This is from RaceDayFans.net. And Haas is unsure if they've solved the tyre wear issue race. Now in the roundup, Kevin Magnussen says that Haas is unsure that they've solved their problems from 2023. Yes, Kevin Magnussen, um, the either hero or villain, depending on what point of view you take for, of Saudi Arabia. Now, despite his teammate Hulkenberg taking that 
slightly controversial for some point in 10th place in Saudi Arabia. Magnus has said his teams aren't sure if they've solved the tyre issues. He, he said, I think Saudi Arabia was another positive weekend. Although, on paper, the Jetta circuit probably wasn't the best for us with the high-speed characteristics. He said, we are still relatively competitive, especially in the race. I had very good pace relative to others at the end, which is our focus this season. We still haven't concluded that we've resolved our issues from last year yet, but we need to do some races. But it was another positive sign that they made progress in the area. So not 100% sure, and I really hope that's not the case. I... Haven't seen too much evidence of that, albeit I'd like to think Kevin Magnuson's going to know, know more about their tie wear than I. So there we go. If you made it to the end, you are absolutely amazing. God, this has been a lengthy episode. So like and subscribe for more F1 news. We'll keep you up to date in the run-up to the Australian Grand Prix and throughout the Australian Grand Prix. And if you're finding F1 boring, we've got rally content as well. Um, we have our F1 1995 Martin Brundle edition where we take that Brundle Ligier from 95 and see how many points we can get. We've won, I think, one race so far at the time of recording this. Let's see if we can win another. Um, So, yeah. And we also have BTCC news. And possibly, I'm going to try and concentrate on the IndyCar news. But I couldn't during the IndyCar opening race. I did watch it. It was okay. Probably a bit more fun than both the F1 races, if I'm honest. However, with all that um Christian Horner stuff... At the weekend, I was really, I was really struggling to have the time, unfortunately. Anyway, I'll throw up the like and subscribe again, you know, just because. Thank you very much. This has been the Hot Lap. Stay tuned. Have a lovely day.